It's Louise's Bible study again. Uh, we're picking up where we left off in the area of healing, and I want to talk right now about, uh, I'm using F.F. Bosworth. If any of y'all have never had Christ the Healer, you need to order it. Uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic book. It really goes into every area uh, of uh, receiving healing and why people don't receive healing and God's will for healing and the atonement for healing. And so it's a great book to study if, if, if you really want to learn. F.F. F. Bosworth, Christ the Healer. He says here, and I'm quoting from him because I give him all the due, does God use bodily affliction? Now, <clears throat> You're going, well, Louis, why are you going there? Because I actually sat in a Sunday school class once where people that I thought <clears throat> they were uh, doctors and lawyers and professors, and uh, they made a statement that just rattled me. I mean, it, it was stupidity gone to shame. And they had said, and I've said this before, but it just blows me away because I can't believe anybody can do this. But I've heard this from others, that this little boy had died and uh, had drowned in the parents' pool. And um, that it was uh, God's will uh, for this little boy to die and that God needed one, another angel in heaven, I can't even begin to go there. And the other was that it was teaching and the testimony from the parents was that through this experience, they had learned amazing, wonderful love and grace and compassion and peace and uh, long-suffering and that God had used this situation to teach them how to be more fruitful in their walk with Him. Let me tell you something, friends. If that's what you think about God, you're in a world of hurt. And you haven't read the Bible. Because you see, God doesn't act like that. God is nothing but love. That's all He is. Pure, absolute love. And... You know, just to think about this whole situation from a common sense point of view. Um, did anybody ever question where was the mother that she had gone in the house and left this toddler roaming around the, the pool and didn't bother to check on them until the child was dead? I'm sorry, that sounds cruel, but it's not. It's a fact. And so, you know, we want to, oh, we just love to throw the blame or some kind of wonderful excuse or we're going to make a martyr out of this situation. None of those things fit. It was because somebody had turned their back, had become distracted, was doing other things, and this accident happened. God didn't push the child in the pool. And he certainly didn't need an angel in heaven because he doesn't turn little boys and little girls into angels in heaven. And he doesn't give you a gift, a human being, a child that he has brought into this world that he expects to grow up and fulfill the purpose for which they are created and suddenly just take them out in a wink of an eye? That, no. I'm sorry, that doesn't happen. That's not God. And on the other hand, what in the world do you think you're going to learn as a child of God's through this situation? Terror? Fear? When's the other shoe going to drop? I mean, we deal with child abusers, people, and they get lifetime sentences for doing something like this. And you want to raise God uh, and say that he did this to one of his own and that this is his way of making corrections and teaching you? God doesn't teach you through adversity. God teaches you through his word. God is merciful. God is kind. God is long-suffering. I mean, 
I had another overheard. I was in a store one day and I overheard a lady say that she was saying to this other lady, well, I'm, I understand that you, you have been diagnosed with cancer. And she said, yes. And she said, I know it's just God's will to teach me patience and faith. People, God doesn't put cancer on you to teach you patience. Patience comes through tribulation, but not sickness. There's a whole different ball game there, okay? And, not, and, and poverty and sickness, he doesn't use that. That's the curse that Jesus died to set you free from. But if Satan can get you to buy into that, well then gung-ho. Because you just open the door for him to put anything he wants to on you. And you're just going to rejoice in it because you're going to say that came from God. Well, let me read you something that Bosworth says here because I think it is really interesting. He says, if sickness, as some think, is the will of God for his faithful children, then it is a sin for them even to desire to be well. This says nothing of spending thousands of dollars to defeat his purpose. I truly thank God for all the help that has ever uh, come to sufferers through the physicians. I have a daughter that's a physician. She's a surgeon. And they're a gift from God. Through the surgeon, the hospital, and the trained nurses. They're gifts from God. But if sickness is the will of God, then to quote one writer, Every physician is a lawbreaker. Every trained nurse is defying the Almighty. Every hospital is a house of rebellion instead of a house of mercy. Now you say, Louise, wait a minute. No, no, no. We're going we're to we're we're turn the argument back on you. Okay? This, this is what Paul does. He takes the argument and he turns it back around and he says, let's think through this with good common sense, okay? Uh, if this were true, instead of supporting hospitals, we ought to do our utmost to close every one of them. Now, let's go back to our premise that it's God's will. It's God's will. For us to be sick. Okay? So that's what he's saying. If the modern theology of those who teach that God wants some of his worshipers to remain sick for his glory is true, then Jesus, during his earthly ministry, never hesitated to rob the Father of all the glory he could by healing all who came to him. You want to read you that again? I want to read you that again. Just let it sink in. Okay? If the modern theology of those who teach that God wants some of his worshipers to remain sick for his glory is true, then Jesus, during his earthly ministry, never hesitated to rob the Father of the glory he could by healing all who came to him. <laughs> His own son. And, 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 and you know what? Jesus said, I've come to do the will of my father. Oh, really? This makes about as much sense as some of our politicians today. Uh, the Holy Spirit likewise robbed him of all the glory he could by healing all the sick in the streets of Jerusalem. And Paul, too, robbed God of all the glory he could by healing all the sick on the island of Malta. Boy, they broke every rule, didn't they? Many today hold that God afflicted even the obedient because he loves them. Oh, man, I tell you what. You go take that to a sinner and preach to them that about your father and they're just going to laugh at you in the face. Why in the world would they want to join your club or your family? Heaven help you to get adopted into that family. 
He loves them, making sickness a love token from our Heavenly Father. I've, I've heard that. I, I mean, I literally have stood there and heard this very argument. And you know what? When I, when I stepped up and did not remain silent and said, y'all can't be saying this. I got kicked out. Do you know that religion will kick you out? Did you know some people would, would rather kick you out and, and spit on you than to admit that they could possibly be wrong? If this is true, why do they try to get rid of his love token? Why does not the one suffering with a cancer pray for a second blessing for themselves and also ask him to thus bless his their wife, their children, father, mothers, and neighbors. Well, let's just give everybody cancer. I mean, I got it, and it's a token blessing from my father, and he's going to teach me something from it, so let's just open it up to the whole family. Does not God sometimes chasten his people through sickness? Decidedly, yes. When we disobey God, sickness may be permitted. Now, I'm, there's, I'm going to clarify this. I want you to listen to me very well. When you disobey God, when you sin, when you are in open disobedience to God's word, when you thumb your nose at Him, when you know what to do right and you do wrong, does God allow or permit sickness? Yes, but He doesn't create the sickness. He does not create sickness. God can't. He can't create sickness. It is not in His ability to create sickness. All sickness comes from Satan. And Job said the very same thing. He said, The thing I feared the most has come upon me. And it wasn't God that opened that door. Job opened that door. He opened that door by the words of his mouth and by his disobedience and fearing instead of casting all his care upon the Lord. Did you know that worry is a sin? Did you know that? Did you know that fear is the opposite of faith? Oh, come on, Louise. No. You know, if you want to get down to the nitty-gritty of why some of these things are happening in your lives, you really got to get down and pinpoint some of the areas that are opening the door in your life that are causing these things to happen. You say, um, God has told us just how it may be avoided and averted. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. You know, the body of Christ doesn't like to judge itself. We're very, very good at playing games with ourselves. We, we'll put the blame on other people. I had a brother, and you know, every everything that went wrong in his life was everybody else's fault. Never, never, ever was it his fault. Never. And you know what? He died. And he died a miserable death. And there wasn't anything I could pray him out of. There wasn't anything anybody else could do about it. Because he never, ever, ever judged his own actions. He never asked repentance for anything that he did. Was he a Christian? Yeah, he's a Christian. There are a lot of Christians that are going to die an early death and go to heaven, but, but they're going to go in broke because they haven't done anything with the life that they've lived here on this earth. But they're going in heaven, but they live their lives short because sin causes your life to be shortened. And so when you, when you refuse to judge your life, when you're, you're not willing... You know, Paul says that many uh, are sick because they refuse to judge the, the when they take the bread at communion, they don't judge themselves. 
And it says, if you have ought against a brother, before you take that communion bread, go and ask forgiveness from the one that you have offended. Now, you may be in a situation where you can't get up and go ask them, but you can at least acknowledge it and later make right what was wrong. But see, some people just want to ask God to forgive them, but they never want to go to the person they've offended because you know why? That's pride. Who wants to get down on your knees and say, please forgive me, I messed up. I really did screw up and it is my fault. My fault. No, we don't want to do that. That would be too much. And you know what? That could very well be the problem that's keeping you from receiving your healing. Maybe you keep something against somebody. So there are other reasons. We need to judge our own actions. We need to look at our life. I study this at night. And you're like, Louise, what is it? It is my scriptural verses on love. And it, it, it doesn't cut you any breaks on this one. I love this one here. It says, love knows how to get along with difficult people. <laughs> yeah. Love knows how not to be first in line. There are so many things that we need to check in our love walk. But he says here that we should judge ourselves. We should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So, Louise, give me a scripture on this one, scripture and verse. I can. There's a scripture in Corinthians. The Corinthians church was notorious. They were like the city of Ephesus. And they had a lot of heathen worship that had gone on in that city. Still what's going on at the time Paul was writing at the Corinthians. And um, and so he was having to, they had a lot of, uh, of the things of the Spirit that were operating. The fact that you have gifts of the Spirit operating is not always an indication of holiness. And uh, these people, they were just drunk on the gifts of the Spirit, but they weren't dealing with the flesh. And they weren't dealing with the things of sin that had come into their church. You see, they had decided to allow the, the world into the church and compromise their beliefs. And when Paul found out about this, what he found out was there was a young man in the church and he was having sex with his uh, stepmother. Now, you know, in today's society, we probably would go, oh, well, no big deal. But actually, Paul just about flipped out. He did. And, and he wrote them a very scathing letter. And he said, oh, let me tell you, he said, this is, I, first off, he said, I can't believe that you have allowed this to go on unnoticed. I can't believe that you have allowed this open sin that everybody in the church knows about to continue in your church as if this person was not doing anything wrong. Now, what in the world would we do in our churches today if a pastor really had the backbone to stand up and make a statement like that? Honey, we would be down, some of them would be down, they'd be lucky if they could fill one pew. But anyway, so Paul told him, he said, let me tell you what you're going to do. We're going to turn this individual over to Satan. Okay. This is where God's protection over him is being taken back. And he said, we're going to turn him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit may be saved in the end. What is he talking about? In other words, he says, he's going to die early. He's going to go to heaven, but he's going to die an early death if he does not repent and y'all don't deal with this. And so they did deal. They went to him. They dealt with it. They confronted him. They said, you can't continue to do this. This is not going to happen. We're kicking you out of the church. You're not going to be under our umbrella of protection anymore. We're not having fellowship with you. We're not all pl playing a game here and pretending like this has never happened. And you're out on your own, dude. And uh, obviously, whatever happened in that interval, it was pretty rough. Because the, the guy came back 
and he, he begged for forgiveness. He repented of what he had done, and he made the situation right. And then Paul told him, okay, now you got to let him back in because he's repented, he's sorry, he's turned around, and so now you let him back into the fellowship, and he's going to be fine. But that's the whole thing that we're talking about here. God can take his hand of protection off of you if you're not willing to deal and correct what it is that's going on. With me, I can tell you right off the bat in one instance lately that I have had to deal with was I am a very, um, I'm, a, I'm a very compulsive person. I'll just own up to that. I am a compulsive person. When I get started on something and start going one way, I mean, I'm all in. I am all in. And I went back to playing tennis, and I did it, and God said, this is a good way for your health, and I was doing it for my health, to build up my lungs, and to, to get my stamina back, and that was fine, and he was okay with that, because, and then all of a sudden, I found myself taking lessons three days a week, then I found myself taking lessons four days a week, then I was taking five days a week, then I was going to clinics, then I was playing in this team, and I was playing in that team, and every time, all of it, I was justifying. I was justifying it to the Lord. Well, God, I'll come home, take a shower, and get into that word. Hallelujah. What did I do? I came home and fell out. And I found excuse after excuse after excuse, but I kept wanting God to put his sign of approval on what I wanted to do rather than turning my life around and saying, God, I'm going to do what you want me to do. And I turned a deaf ear to him and I kept doing what I wanted to do. We do that, folks. We, we make up all kind of reasons that we think God is justifying our behavior. And you know what happened? My hand gave out. I could turn around and say, well, Satan did this. Satan did. He did do it. He brought arthritis on me. But who opened the door, Louise? Who opened the door? Me. Why? Because of my disobedience. Because as God said, I didn't call you to be a tennis player. I called you to preach the word. And you had put in the call that you had on your life on hold. You know, it, it takes time. It takes, it takes energy. It takes obedience. It takes willingness. And it takes diligence to teach God's word. And it's a lot more fun to go out there and bat a ball around. So what am I saying here? I'm saying that, you know... God wants the best for you. But if you keep hardening your heart and doing your own thing and turning your, your ear away from him, if you've got situations that are there, you need to check them out. You need to, you need to go to the Holy Spirit like I did and say, okay, I have missed it. I have really missed it. Show me. Not only will he show you, but he can turn this situation around that Satan meant for evil, and he can turn it around for good. But he can't turn the ship around without your help. And you've got to be the one that's in the driver's seat that's willing to say, okay, we're going to turn this around. I'm going to change my actions. I'm going to, I repent. David did that. David sinned. And God took his repentance. Now, David paid a price for that for a while, and his family and everything else. But eventually, he got it back. He got it back. But, you know, we, we don't want to think about that. We don't, we're not into the age of accountability. Accountability is not in our vocabulary. Uh, you know, and, and we need to make that a real big prime word in our spiritual walk. Because we are accountable for our actions. And I just want to end right here saying God loves you and God loves me. And he never intended for any of these things to come on me. But I brought it on myself and I acknowledge that. And now I'm on the road to recovery. 
Hallelujah. If you get off the road, people, put your car in reverse, turn the wheels, get back on track, and keep going. Don't let your mistakes cause you to put your car in park and turn the engine off. And that's what so many of us do. I love you. Tune in next time. We've got a lot more to study. Bye-bye.